Hello, I'm Jack Van Horn of the Institute for Neuroimaging and Informatics and the Laboratory of Neuroimaging at the Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California. What I'd like to describe for you is an examination that we undertook to map the connectomics in the noted case of Phineas Gage. The story goes that in 1848, Mr. Gage was working as a foreman to prepare the railroad bed for the Rutland and Burlington Railroad just outside of the town of Cavendish in the state of Vermont. He was working to fill a borehole with black powder in order to blast and thereby remove the rock. Ordinarily, sand is poured on top of the black powder and a tamping iron, which is a 17-pound, 3-foot-long, javelin-shaped hunk of iron, is used to tamp down the contents of the hole in order to ensure an efficient fracturing of the rock. In this instance, Mr. Gage got distracted and was turning his attention to his men or some other distraction and looking slightly back over his right shoulder. At some point in this process, the sand was not poured into the borehole. When Mr. Gage dropped his tamping iron into the hole, it struck the rock, caused a spark, and caused the powder to explode. Like a missile, the tamping iron was sent upwards through Mr. Gage's cheek, up through his cranial vault, and out through the top of his head. The force of the explosion and the tamping iron passing through his head violently throws Mr. Gage backwards and onto the ground where he remains unconscious for a few moments, but he's eventually able to sit up, speak to his men, describe what happened, and board an ox cart to be taken into the local town. There he is met by Dr. John Martin Harlow, who commences the formal treatment of Mr. Gage and his wounds. The injury is so severe that Dr. Harlow can take the index finger from each hand, pass it into the entry and exit wounds left by the tamping iron, and touch his fingertips somewhere in the middle of Mr. Gage's head. Gage struggles for days, in and out of fever and consciousness and suffering an infection. Uh, he suffers confusion, difficulty reasoning, and other symptoms. But eventually he's able to recover sufficiently to return to his family home in the neighboring state of New Hampshire. But he suffers very severe personality changes as a result of this very severe injury. In fact, the injury was so severe that his friends and acquaintances didn't even really recognize him, and they said that he was, quote, no longer Gage, unquote. The story of Mr. Gage and his injury has become one of the most fascinating and compelling stories in the history of neuroscience. His skull exists today at the Warren Anatomical Museum at Harvard Medical School, and while much literature has been written about this famous case, it's the work of two men, Dr. John Martin Harlow and later Dr. Henry Jacob Bigelow, that we have as a basis for all of the description of his injury and his symptomatology following that tragic event. We were very fortunate to receive the last known and best quality CT scan data of the Phineas Gage skull. Using these CT data, we were able to create a three-dimensional model of the Phineas Gage skull. We also drew from a database containing the magnetic resonance and diffusion tensor imaging data from modern subjects whose demographic characteristics were similar to that of Mr. Gage and fit them mathematically into the cranial vault of the Phineas Gage skull. In so doing, we were able to see which fiber pathways would have been affected by the passage of the tamping iron. This is a summary slide showing how we went from the skull, modeled the trajectory of the tamping iron, fit the tamping iron through the data, fit the data into the cranial vault, showed how it impacted white matter fiber pathways. The next step we undertook is that of connectomic mapping, where structural information and white matter fiber information is systematically examined to parcelate the brain into known anatomical regions, calculate the regional interconnectivity, and then render that as something we call a connectogram. A connectogram, shown here for an individual subject, is a circular representation of brain morphometry and interregional connectivity. The left hemisphere of the circle represents the left hemisphere of the brain, while the right side of the circle represents the right hemisphere of the brain. Each of these are broken into little segments. Those segments represent each of the major lobes of the brain. Each segment of the connectogram, comprising a lobe of the brain, can be subdivided into the individual brain regions which comprise that lobe. Then, 
Using computational tools, we can make measurements on the properties of those particular segments. In this case, we can measure the gray matter volume, the parcellation area, the gray matter thickness, and the mean curvature, as well as the degree of connectivity that that brain region has with other areas of the brain. The lines in the connectogram represent the density of connections as well as their fidelity. Here is an example of an average connectogram map pooled over 110 healthy right-handed males between the ages of 25 and 36 years old. By passing the tamping iron through the brain in each of our 110 subjects, we are able to measure the effects on cortical morphometry as well as white matter connectivity. In this connectogram, you'll see the pathways of those fibers which were affected by the passage of the tamping iron. You'll notice that most of the injury occurs in the left hemisphere, particularly the left frontal lobe, but that those connections connect throughout the left hemisphere and even cross over into the right hemisphere. In order to assess the effects that the tamping iron had on our subject's white matter networks, we undertook a graph theoretical analysis to measure several key parameters which are important for brain networks. These are integration, segregation, and small worldness. We performed our measurements in the intact networks where no lesions had been applied, then that of the tamping iron where the effects of the tamping iron were present, and that of simulated lesions where we systematically moved a lesion randomly around the brain and made measurements as we went. To make a long story short, this analysis illustrates that while the tamping iron injury was certainly severe, altering many of these key parameters, uh, it was not as severe as might have been incurred had the lesion occurred elsewhere in his brain. In conclusion, while the story of Mr. Gage is very much about gray matter injury in his left frontal lobe, it's also a story about destroyed white matter connectivity that affected areas throughout his brain. While the damage was restricted to his left frontal lobe, the white matter damage, as indicated by our analysis, was not only local to that lesion, but also affected connections intra- and interhemispherically. This likely contributed to the behavioral changes described by Dr. Harlow. While well, in our analysis, global network metrics reflected profound alterations to network architecture. White matter alterations, particularly of the frontal lobes, are known to affect executive functions and personality changes in degenerative and certain psychiatric illnesses. These are often referred to as diseases of connectivity. And in the case of Mr. Gage, while the network level damage was certainly severe, it was not as great as what might have been experienced in the average lesion. This tends to suggest that Mr. Gage may have had some degree of functional recovery and some degree of uh, cognitive um, improvement following his injury. These considerations, along with joint cortical and white matter mapping methods, are really important for understanding the historical context as well as the neurological context in the case of Mr. Gage. They also provide us with new ways in which to conceptualize and contextualize modern psychiatric as well as neurological symptoms. For further reading on this topic and others, please refer to these particular articles. Thank you so much for your time.